Don't ever go on this journey of trying to sell your business without knowing. Brian Clayton, he's a successful entrepreneur and co-founder of GreenPal, an online platform that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. When you sold the business, was it anywhere near what you thought you could get? What was a key lesson in that for you? I was penny wise and dollar dumb. And then a lot of the stuff that lifestyle business owners do, travel and vacations, acquirers don't want to see that. And so you kind of have to go back and clean that stuff up. If you're explaining, you're losing. The way those three businesses kind of operated wasn't set up right the first time. There wasn't a cohesive, repeatable sales machine. I didn't want to spend 50 grand, so I spent five. And that dumb decision probably ended up costing me a million dollars at sale. You mentioned about this being self-funded, GreenPal, your company, which full disclosure, I went on, I set up an account. I actually used it, even though I can't use it in the Dominican, I used it for my house in Michigan. I got quotes. It worked. It was a pretty cool little uh, user experience on my end. Nice. But, so you said that you started this company without any outside capital. But you also said if you did raise money, you likely would have wasted that. How do you know? How do you know you would have wasted it? Yeah, it, it was uh, it was kind of a hard decision because when we first got going, we went on the same path that everybody told us we should do, where which is if you're starting a tech business, you should go raise a bunch of angel funding and then and then try to put up the numbers to raise a series A, series B, and so on. And so we started to do that. And I quickly got burnt out doing that, where where I was running all over town trying to pitch people on twenty and thirty thousand dollar checks. And I thought, man, you know, I just want to build a product that people want to use, that people will get value from, and I don't want to build something that investors love. I want to build something that that customers would love. And, and so it was kind of like a personal preference thing. I just didn't really want to do that. <laughs> and, and, I, and I had no appetite to do that. So, so we went with the slow and low approach where we, we hacked together our first version of the app. My two co-founders still worked uh, day jobs and, and did for the first three years. I didn't take a salary for the first three or four years. And we got 10 customers and then got 100 customers and got 1,000 customers and slowly bankrolled the app off of its own revenues. And that did a couple things for us. That kept us very crystal clear on what we should be focusing our firepower on, which is the customers. We didn't. I didn't want any pressure on the business other that wasn't uh, that wasn't forced onto the business other than by customers, and mm. because we needed that revenue, we needed to keep them as a customer. And and as as simple as that sounds. A lot of new new startups that raise uh, venture capital lose sight of that, and they they try to juice metrics and try to put up numbers rather than building something that customers love. So it was kind of like a self correcting mechanism for us, especially in the early years, to build something that people wanted to use and would keep using. and And, and I think if we had raised a million or two, maybe five million dollars, we would have wasted it all because I was a second time founder. I had built and sold an eight figure business already, but that was my first tech business, so it was very much kind of like starting all over again. And, and I didn't know how to deploy that kind of capital and probably would have wasted it all. And then we would have had a screwed up cap table and, and we would have been underwater like many, many startups are you know, today uh, trying to work through that. For both businesses, the landscaping business that you exited for 10 million and then GreenPal, were both started with the idea that you were going to exit? You know, the, the first company, um, no. I was building it as a lifestyle business. I was building it as uh, something that I was going to run forever. I, I really felt like it was just going to be the thing I did forever. And 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 the the notion hit me, I guess year twelve or thirteen, where I thought, you know, maybe I could sell this business. I I had kind of plateaued as a founder. I I wasn't I wasn't growing alongside the company anymore, and that bothered me. So I thought I thought maybe I can maybe I can sell this company and. And I uh, quickly learned that, that that's, that's a lot harder than it looks. And I had to kind of reverse engineer a lot of things into the business. I had to take the business down to the studs almost and rebuild it from the inside out to get it to where it could be acquired. I wish I had a book at the time called Built to Sell. It's a really good book that, that talks about how to intentionally work an exit plan to sell your company. Would have well, uh, Real quick, before, before you move on to Green Pal on that, what are, down to the studs. What are some examples of that? What do you mean by down to the studs? Yeah, so... I had to go backwards to go forward. So, so the first thing was um, just the structure of the business, how we, uh, how we thought about the org chart of the business, the hierarchy of, of how uh, account managers handled customer interactions and how salespeople handed that business off to account managers. 
I didn't really build that right the first time. I, I had some some accounts that were handled by the original salespeople, and I had some accounts that that uh, that I sold personally that that I still kind of did in the in, in my spare time, and it was just kind of a mess. There wasn't a a uh, cohesive repeatable sales machine to say, okay, this is how we go out and get new business. This is how we bring it into the company. And then this is how it's handed off and transitioned to an account manager. So that was one, one thing that I had to kind of strip out and rebuild from the inside out. Another thing was how we did our accounting. Uh, we, We had to redo all of our accounting to where it was in, in gap generally accepted accounting principles. And, and, uh, most small businesses aren't in, in that, uh, form of accounting. And so we had to do that. That took like a year and, and several hundred thousand dollars in, in accounting fees to, to figure out. Um, and then the list goes on and on and on how we, how we standardized the equipment that we had in the business. Uh, we had to sell a bunch of stuff that was hodge, hodgepodge and, and, uh, and you know, you know, make that universal and make that standardized. You really have to make your business run like a McDonald's. So uh, it has to run on its own. It has to be standardized. It has to be a well-oiled machine because nobody wants to buy something that, that is, uh, that, that, that is just kind of run by the seat of your pants that somebody has to get in there and wrangle. It, it should really be running smoothly. And, and the funny thing is, by the time you, you do all that, you probably won't want to sell it anymore. That was kind of... <laughs> That's kind of how, how I experienced it. After I, after I took me like two years to do all that, I, I kind of fell in love with the business all over again. But by that point, I had made my bets and it was time to, to move on. On the generally accepted accounting practices, real quick, I, I, it's, it's funny you say, I'm a small business guy, me. I'm more lifestyle and you wonder about, could I sell what I do one day? What are, do you recall one or two things that you were doing that you said most small businesses do from an accounting perspective, that gap made you was like, oh my God, this would have been so simple had I done it when I started. I'm sure it's everything, but like, are there one or two that would have been so simple had you known this about GAAP when you started versus now having to go back and re-engineer it? Do you recall anything? Tribe listeners, I have an extremely exciting announcement for all of you. Do you want to come hang out with Cody Sanchez, David Osborne, David Green, Rich Roll, and even yours truly down in Austin, Texas? Well, let's do it. May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd for the first time ever. GoBundance, the exclusive millionaire membership group, is opening up an event to anyone, man, woman, millionaire or not, and we're calling it the Austin Entrepreneurial Summit. At the AES, you'll meet all those people I mentioned, plus GoBundance members on both the men's and women's side, and I'll be there hanging out the entire time. Every event I've ever attended for GoBundance has given me a disproportionate return on the money spent and the time spent to get there. And this is the biggest one that GoBundance has ever done. So if you're a member, not a member, and you're looking to supercharge the second part of your year 2024, this event in May is a great way to get that all kickstarted. Go to GoBundance.com slash AES right now for early bird pricing for members and guests. And warning, the power of GoBundance events is that it holds you accountable long after you're gone to achieving whatever goals you've set. So this event will change your life. GoBundance.com slash AES. I'll see you there. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, we we had a lot of mess with respect to, we had three divisions in the business. We had maintenance, we had irrigation systems, and we had landscaping installation. And, and, and the way those three businesses kind of operated from like a uh, profit center, so to speak, wasn't set up right the first time. And it, so it was a lot of these businesses that the, the, the costs weren't, uh, uh, weren't correctly assigned to, to each, I guess you could say pillar. And, uh, one kind of bared a lot of overhead that it shouldn't have and the others didn't. And, and so there wasn't a real like clean way to look at these three divisions to look at the profitability. And that was something that, that I screwed up from the beginning. Cause I didn't set that up. Right. So I had to like go back and fix a lot of that stuff. And then, and then a lot of the stuff that's that lifestyle business owners do where travel and vacations and personal vehicles and, and, uh, things that are kind of in the gray, gray areas that we, that, that you write off that is just kind of part of the perks of, of running a small business. You know, I mean, people acquirers don't want to see that. And, and so you kind of have to go back and clean that stuff up. Uh, if you, the more of that stuff that you have, uh, the, the least attractive your business is. And when you're, when you're going to sell your business, the more explaining you have to do, if you're explaining you're, you're losing. And so like, it should just be real clean and it should be a stand on its own. And, and, uh, it took me a year 
uh, to clean all that up. And, and if I had known I was going to sell it, I wouldn't have done any of that in the first place. I, I would have ran, ran a proactive approach to, to make sure it was all building on itself. And I, I didn't have to like go backwards to go forwards. Is this, is it as simple as hiring a CPA who understand if somebody's starting with the idea of exit built to sell, like you mentioned, is it as simple as hiring the right type of CPA who understands how to structure a business to eventually sell? Or is that, is that, is that oversimplifying what you could do at the beginning of a startup? Um, well, the right CPA is important. And so I was penny wise and dollar dumb. I didn't want to spend uh, 20 or 30 grand a year on CPA bills. And so, and so I just had a bookkeeper and a tax accountant. And, and so I was spending maybe three or five grand a year for a business doing multi-millions in revenues. I, I didn't want to spend 50 grand, so I spent five. And that dumb decision probably ended up costing me a million dollars at sale. Um, and, and, uh, if I had worked, if I had worked with a, with a CPA that knew what they were doing, that was proactive in their approach, that knew I wanted to groom the business to sell, then, then I, I would have had probably a 20% more outcome at, at sale. And, and, and it would have been a lot easier, a lot smoother, a lot less stress trying to get the business sold. Um, but you can't just say, Hey, CPA, I want to sell my business. You need to be able to delegate that from a position of, of, of uh, stewardship. So you have to know, you're the pilot, you're the shepherd of this thing. So you have to know the 80-20 of, of what it takes to get a business sold. You know, that book Built to Sell is a great book. Read it three times, internalize these things, and then and then deploy that with your approach. You can't just delegate it. Say, oh, you handle it. Let me know when it's done. Because then you don't know if you're on track or not. You don't know if, if you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because not all CPAs are the same, like, like, like lawyers. You know, every one of them is different. They specialize in different things. And you want to make sure you get the right one. When you sold the business, you mentioned that maybe it cost you a million dollars at sale. Was, there, was it anywhere near what you thought you could get? Whatever education you got on the likelihood of the, of the multiple or whatever it might be, was it anywhere near what you thought you would get? And if so or if not, what was a key lesson in that for you? Well, a lot of what goes into uh, getting your business sold, getting it acquired, is managing your own psychology and managing uh, your expectations going through the process. And, you know, don't ever go on this journey of trying to sell your business without knowing that the business could, that it could fall through, that the deal could fall through. Uh, there's a guy named Paul Graham uh, who's, uh, who, who, who founded Y Combinator, and uh, he has a saying. He says, uh, birds fly, fish swim, and deals fall through. And, and so if you can like tell yourself that 10 times before you try to do this, then you'll have the expectation that most likely the deal is going to fall through. And you don't want to get into a situation where you've kind of like driven off the cliff and you have to make the deal happen because this is like something you're going to do one or two, maybe three times in your life if you're lucky. And the people on the other end of that transaction do it every day. And so they're going to smell blood and they're going to eat you alive if they can sense that you're beholden to the outcome. So never go into this like thinking, okay, my, my expectations are this and I'm going to get this and it's going to be done in six months because that's going to be counterproductive and, and the people on the other side of the transaction are going to, are going to sense that and they're going to retrade on you at the very end. And, and, uh, and, and <laughs> like I'm, I'm from Tennessee, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to break you over their knee like a double barrel shotgun. And, and, uh, and they're going to, they're going to smell that. And so, um, for me, I had, a, 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 that's exactly what happened. I had an anticipation that we were going to sell the business for X and we ended up getting the, the business sold for about 70% of X. And so it felt like I lost, uh, you know, and there was a lot of retrading uh, in, in the, in the, you know, in the red zone, I guess you could say on the, on the five yard line at the very end. And I, and I was going to walk away from the deal actually. And because I didn't feel like I was getting a fair shake and, and I said, you know what? The business is running good. It's more profitable than ever. And I'm not going to go through with this. And they actually threatened to sue me uh, mm. to to close. And 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 if and and I would have been tied up in litigation for like three years. They knew that. And then you can't sell the business for another three years. So birds fly, fish swim, and deals fall through. <laughs> <laughs> great, great advice. I like that. Um, you sell the business, you say that they're retrading you at the five yard line and you almost walk away. I get why you didn't being sued. Was it price? Was it terms? What was it that was just not, 
unpalatable for you or seeming like why why even go through with this? A lot of things uh so so there's a lot of moving parts in a business like that. You had inventory and materials and then billing. Uh, a lot of our contracts were spread over 12 months and so they're like there was this cutoff issue where and then and then they would go and look at an account by account and say, "Well, you've done X, Y, and Z for this account, but not this account." And and so every day it was $100,000 or $200,000 haircut uh be, because of of these kind of moving pieces to the deal and yeah you get a letter of intent you get you get some things that kind of outline the broad strokes of how valuation is going to be calculated um but but uh you know do you get to keep the cash that's in the bank with the business that's my cash no that's their cash and so that mm-hmm. could be several hundred thousand dollars so there's all these things and 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 maybe that's put in there on purpose to where they can they can they can, you know, get one all, get one over you uh, at the very end. At least that's how, how it happened for me. I'm still glad I got it sold, and the people that bought it um, are doing well with it. And, and and my people that helped me build a business got to carry on and, and prosper with that new company. So I have no regrets. I just wish I had done it differently, uh, and I wish I had had a more proactive approach. But you don't really know these things until you go through it. And and no matter how much somebody tells you and how many books you read, there's still going to be a lot of things that you're going to learn just through the school of hard knocks. I love that. I think that's an amazing point to make for sure. I'm learning that myself. Uh, last question on this before we move over to green pal, or at least the transition and then green pal. Um, did you have to stay in the business for any period of time or was it sold and gone for you? Yeah, I had to, I had to stay on. They wanted me to stay for six months. Um, and I ended up hanging around the office for two months. They hired an operations manager that kind of wanted me to leave because because <laughs> all of my people were still looking to me because uh, yeah. they a lot of them had been with me for 15 years, and so they were still looking to me as as kind of the the jefe. And um, so they want they they actually kind of pushed me out, which which was fine. I was ready to move on. Uh, and then and then I was there, you know, to be reached by by any means necessary, you know, text, email, phone call on a daily basis to kind of help with stuff. And that went on for a few more months. So that, so that piece of it actually did work out. I was ready to, 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 to create the space for the next thing. What was the space before the next thing? So in other words, green pal is something that you obviously started. Was it instant or did you take some time and what did you do? Yeah, I took some time off. I, I, I didn't have any real anticipation of starting another company so quickly, I thought that after I sold that business that I was just going to like live the good life. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I I thought, you know, I've worked my butt off for 15 years. I don't really want to do anything stressful ever again. And, and I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just do like real estate investing and do passive investing. And, and I read a book by Robert Kiyosaki called the Cash Flow quadrant in that book. He, he talks about this mythical character, the capitalist. And I thought, man, that sounds really cool. I want to be a capitalist. I could just be in deals and not have to like manage people and and grind a, a hard <laughs> a hard you know slog it out type of business ever again. That's really what I wanted to do, and um, that got existential real quick. Like after about three months of that, six months of that, I was like, man, you know, I don't have I don't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. I don't I don't have a project. I don't have a mission, and uh, and I thought, man, I just. I think I need to start another business. I think I need to get back in the game. And, and I, and I, I thought, uh, at the time, this was 2013, 14 Uber was, was getting rolling. Like they were starting to become ubiquitous. And, and for the first time you could, you could, you, from an interface, from a screen, you could push a button and something would happen in the real world. Uh, up until then, uh, you know, technology, digital interfaces was very much atoms. It wasn't bits. It was very much like uh, it was. It wasn't like you pushed a button and magic happened. And then Uber showed us that actually, no, like the, like the smartphone could be the remote control for your life. And if you think about it, these days, ten years later, it, it really is. You you can use it to do anything. And uh, I thought, well, somebody's going to build this for for lawn mowing. Uh, I, and I was fairly certain that 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 the idea was going to exist. And and, and I, I felt like, well, why can't that be me? It looked really easy in the social network. Um, so maybe I can do that. And I didn't, I'd never built a website or I'd never, i never learned the first thing about technology. And, and so it was very much naivete as an asset. And, sure. uh, and so I, I, I recruited two co-founders that wanted to jump in the trenches with me. And we started working 
on the idea of what the Uber for lawn care would look like. And we called it Green Pal, and we paid a development shop to build the first version of Green Pal. And that was a big mistake. Uh, it was a very hard lesson that we learned uh, right out of the gate that that wouldn't work. We we wasted a damn near a year and 150 grand doing that. And <laughs> we, we released that, that version of the app and it was dead on arrival. And we hustled up a few, a few dozen customers to use it. They all told us all the ways that it sucked, but they never told us they didn't need it. They always were like let down that it didn't work. And we took that as validation that it was a good idea. And so we thought, well, this is like a punch in the stomach moment. If we're going to be in this game, we're going to have to learn how to build software. And so my co-founder went to a software boot camp and then I took every online class I could take on, on YouTube and, and a bunch of other different websites on how to, how to do front end engineering and it took about a year, but we taught ourselves how to build software. And then we rebuilt the whole thing over again. And now here we are 10 years later, Green Pal, I guess is a 10 year overnight success. We, we have around th- <laughs> 300,000 people using this, this, this app that we built and, and uh, using it to get lawn mowing done. Co-founders have day jobs. None of you, it sounds like, have a tech background. You obviously have the landscaping background. And I know that this idea is derived, I think you were a commercial landscaper toward the end and a lot of residential clients would call and like, hey, why not create a space for them? So it makes sense. I get all of that. Question one is why co-founders? Why bring anyone on? I would assume based on your exit that you probably could fund it yourself. Why bring on co-founders? Really, really good question. It needs to be talked about a lot more. So I got really, really, really lucky. I, I I had two guys that had a chip on their shoulder, like me, that just wanted to build something big that was going to touch the mass market. They they wanted to they weren't happy with their station in life and they and they wanted to be a part of a project that that could that could get them from here to there. And and they were willing to do whatever it took to be successful. And it, that was really all we had. We had that and my my background in the industry. We didn't have anything else. So we had three guys with a chip on their shoulder and I knew the landscaping business, everything else we had to learn. And, and I got lucky that, that, uh, I, I picked wisely. Most of the time, bad co-founder dynamics, um, cause your business to fail more often than, than not. And you get going back to Paul Graham again, he, he says, ideally you get a hacker and a hustler. So you get somebody who, who knows the, the technical side, you know, they, They've been tinkering with websites their whole life. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they hacked into their high school website and changed their grades or something. You know, like like they they have been like a tinkerer for technology their whole life. And then then you get a hustler. You know, uh, maybe in high school they were mowing yards or had a or, or had a paper route or were washing cars or something. And they've always been like a hustler. They've been looking for ways to make money and and uh, and they've always wanted to run a business. And you get these two personality types together and one plus one is five or 10 or a hundred like a Steve jobs and a Steve Wozniak. We, sure. we had three hustlers, you know, we didn't have any hackers, so we had to become hackers. And uh, so, so when you are looking for a co-founder, look for builders, don't look for idea people, look for somebody who has a skill. Uh, you know, are they a designer? Are they a coder? Uh, are they, you know, can they actually build? And, uh, and, and don't look for just business or idea people because they're pretty much useless in, 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 in starting a startup. And, and hmm. the way I look at it is, uh, unless, so, so if, if you had $10 million in the bank, would you strike this co-founder a check for $10 million to start the business with you? And if you wouldn't, then don't. Because ultimately or maybe even very soon, that equity you're going to give them is going to be worth $10 million. Or maybe you want to go raise funding and then the, the dilution you're going to take is going to be that or more. So so don't start the business with somebody unless you would write them a check for $10 million day one. So you, you really kind of have to think through that. Um, and, you know, for me, I got, I got lucky, but hope is not a strategy when it comes to this stuff. So take it as far as you can solo, then, then get your business soulmate and co-found the business with them. And if you don't find that soulmate, go it alone. It's like, don't get married just to get married. And that's really what, what a co-founder relationship is. It's a marriage. 
I want to talk about the luck part because it plays a role, but there's also lessons extracted about what made it lucky. But let me ask you this, and this might be unfair. If you were to go back and do this again with what you know now, uh, let me, let me modify that. Knowing what you know now or the lesson you just taught, would you, do you think going back, not choose the co-founders you have great hustlers? They ended up and all's well that ends well. But if you, with the lessons you've learned and all of what you just explained, would these not be the co-founders you choose knowing what you know now? Really good question. Um, it's, it's hard be, because, because hindsight's always 2020, uh, you know, if, if I, if, if I had to do it all over again with everything I had then, all the knowledge I had then, and if I didn't have my co-founders, we would not, I would not have gotten to where I am today. Got it. And, and even, even if it's just like a simple benevolence thing, it's like, I got to come in and work seven days a week because my co-founders are. So just that piece of it is, is very important in the early days. So all things equal, if I, if I went it alone, I would have petered out in the first year or two. So that's, that's just how it would have, would have gone down. Now, if I had to do it all over again, starting today with the knowledge I have, yeah, sure, I could do it solo. But that's not what I had at the time. I didn't, right. I didn't know what I know now, so, so I can't look at it that way. What were the, what, what do you, can you quantify luck? So you got lucky with these two, you said you're all hustlers, um, which means obviously that you're going to go and you're going to grind and you're going to push forward. They had a big why. It sounds like they wanted to change the circumstances of their lives. That's near and dear to me. I quit a big corporate job at 42, making a few hundred grand plus equity uh, a year. And I have a partner now who's on that path. Same thing. Like he's unfulfilled and like, can I side hustle him for a while? Or would he do it with me? Which he is. And we're building to get him out of that. So that, that means a lot hearing you say that, but what are the elements that you think created the luck? They weren't tech people. They weren't the hackers. So what is it about them that made it lucky? If that makes any sense. Yeah, it was a lot of times uh, luck and, 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 a, and, and like even a superpower can be just mistaken for consistency. We, we just decided that we were going to focus on a very small number and we were going to throw everything we had into achieving that small number. If we had to work seven days a week, uh, 10 hours a day, that's just what we were going to do. And, and so that kind of like the harder we worked, the luckier we got. And, and so we, we were lucky because we knew each other, we trusted each other and, and we were willing to do whatever it took to be successful. But then also we, we, we picked a pretty good idea. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like we were catching lightning in a bottle. We, it's been very much a, a linear grind from 10 customers to now 300,000. So, so there was never a moment where we hit this hockey stick inflection point and there was never like some lucky huge break for us. It was very much like a running game in football. There was no long shots downfield. Um, so I can't, I can't point to like any lucky aha moment we had. But we got lucky in terms of good co-founder dynamics and a good idea and just a, a, a relentless consistency to, to, to create our own luck along the way. Um, that, that's, that's how I would describe it. And, and uh, I think the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, that's how it's been for me 22 years in my first business and my second business. There's the old adage, you know, uh, uh, follow your passion. And what I hear from you is, hey, I've got this, this knowledge in landscaping. 13 years old, start mowing lawns. Years later, I sell it for eight figures. Uh, I'm going to take that and go live the big life, like you said. But yeah, I can imagine high achiever, driven guy, three months is enough of the big life. And then it's like, I, I got to have something to do. Find these founders and you get into a business that made sense. I mentioned it a moment ago. You have this commercial landscaping business. You're, you're getting all these residential calls. You refer it out and none of the residential landscapers are answering the calls that you refer out. So enter the business of Green Pal. It makes a ton of sense. Is, is passion or fulfillment at all a component in the decision that you made to start Green Pal? Is that even in the equation for you as a founder? Yeah, I, th I think the advice follow your passion can be misunderstood and I think it can be bad advice um, because I've never been passionate about the lawn mowing business. Uh, in fact, I hate the lawn mowing business. I, I hated it when I ran a lawn mowing business and, and I don't like anything about the lawn mowing business today. Um, so, so I think follow your passion can be bad advice because I've never been passionate about the industry that I'm in. 
But I am passionate about progress, building something bigger than me, building something that other people around me get value from, uh, getting people together on a common vision and a common purpose, and then let's all go there together and work really hard on it. That's fun. Um, building something that people get value from. That, to me, it creates fulfillment. That gives me a sense of purpose. And I am passionate about that. The, the, the lawns just happen to be the vehicle to, to, get, to get there. And, and now, today, um, I take very seriously what we do. We, we have a platform that 32,000 small business owners use to make their livelihood. And so it's very important that we show up every day and, and give it our all, that we don't half-ass it. Because there's a lot of small business owners that depend on us to make their mortgage payment, to pay their car payment, put a kid through school, uh, pay off credit card debt, whatever. Um, so that's very important to me. And that gives me fulfillment. So I am passionate about that. I am not passionate about the lawn mowing business. In fact, I, there's a lot of things about it I don't like. But, but I am passionate about building a platform that people get value from. How do you structure your role within that? such that you're not involved. You know, like, so I'm curious, how do you structure your role? Do you align it all with your strengths or are you working more on your weaknesses? Like, how are you structuring your role within the business and how does it relate to what you're great at or what you're bad at or whatever? Where do you lean in? Yeah, I think every business reaches the, uh, the choke point of the founder's capabilities. And mm. in, in pretty much any, <laughs> any problem in any business, small or large, can be mapped back to the founder's uh, shortcomings. So you could say, you know, you, you, I mean, you, you, you can look, look at any business. So, so uh, uh, look at, you know, you can look at Uber. Uh, well, why, why did for such a long time did drivers hate Uber? Well, because they didn't put an emphasis on, uh, you know, driver relations. Well, why didn't they do that? Well, because they focus more on the consumer side. Well, why did they do that? Well, because that was what decisions were made. And it maps back to Travis Kalanick just didn't, never made a living driving a cab. And he was the founder. And so, like, he didn't really care. And so, like, even as big a company as that was, uh, which, I mean, he's a hero of mine, but but that's a reality of how, how it went down. And so every single uh, limitation that a business deals with can usually like cascade and be mapped back to the founder's inabilities and shortcomings. So what does that mean? You as the founder, you have to like be 80, 20 good at a lot of different things. You can't just say, oh, I'm not good at data analysis. So you go handle that. And I'm not good at, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not good at SEO or content or design or copywriting. You go handle that. Like, no, like in the early days, you got to be average at all of these things. And, and so that's what I've tried to do. Uh, I've tried to become like dangerously good, not like really good, but just like 80, 20 good at pretty much everything. Cause that's one thing I learned early on running this business was, or starting this business was I could learn enough to be dangerous at pretty much anything. And, and I could do it myself for a while and then I could understand how to delegate it. And so now fast forward, our team is still pretty small. We're about 40 people. And, and that's a good number for me. I don't want to get much bigger than that. Um, but it's kind of scaffolding around me because, because it's, it's uh, you know, at some, some point in time, I've done every job myself personally or my co-founders have that we, that we delegate out. And so that's, that's how I look at it today. It's kind of like a hub and spoke thing. And that's not a scalable way to, to grow a, a 500 person or a thousand person company, but it works for about 50 or 60 people. And that's, that's kind of where I want to keep the business. Until what? Is there an exit plan? You know, until I stop having fun, honestly, uh, I enjoy running this thing. It's, it's you know, we're, we're year 10 or 11 now, and we're making good money, and we're able to pay ourselves a really good salary and, and then also have a, have enough money to reinvest back in the business and, and hire new people or, or uh, you know, fractional people, bring them on full time or hire better people. So that's a lot of fun. When you're making enough money where you can you, you kind of wear the hat of capital allocator. It goes back to the capitalist thing that, that I was yeah. seduced by, by 10 years ago. Well, now I kind of am a capitalist where, where money comes in and I have the hat of a capital allocator. I have to put money back out to work. And um, this is like poker almost. You're making bets and you're trying to make small bets and then figure out which ones you're going to double down on. And, and, uh, and, and that's a lot of fun, especially when it works. 
And so I'm having fun doing this. I, I, I still want to build something that touches the mass market. And I don't think we've gotten there yet. We're not a household name. And I think uh, we're at around, around 300,000 people using the app to get lawn mowing done. I want to be at a million. And I want Green Pal to be in the same kind of conversation or lane as a Instacart or a DoorDash or an Uber. You know, you just, this is just the default way you do this chore. So we've still got a long way to go. You mentioned earlier that in year one, you wasted a year and $150,000 sort of outsourcing the build, if you will, of this tech platform. I get the mistake. I get, you know, man, if you could go back and do that again. I, this question comes from, I think, the perspective or the mindset of maybe your partners, maybe my partner, maybe me at some point, that sometimes we're frozen in place to get started because we're afraid of that big mistake. So my question for you is this, as a, as a smaller founder of more lifestyle businesses now that maybe one day I want to sell or some of them I want to sell. Are you able to ever avoid somewhere the equivalent of the one year, $150,000 mistake? Like, is it inevitable? Is it avoidable really on some level? Maybe not that mistake, but some mistake, like do founders or anybody that has the dream of founding a company and maybe getting out of their job, whatever, do they need to get their head around that? Or is it actually, if you do this and this, yeah, these mistakes are avoidable. It's, it's a really good question. So couple things. It's okay to make mistakes, but just don't make the same mistake twice. So you got to learn from the mistake and then you got to, then you, then you got to like not do that again. We, we, we kept throwing good money after bad on this particular big mistake we made. We didn't want to believe that we had to learn how to build software. And so we would, you know, it was very clear about month two. I knew that I knew that it wasn't going well. And then I kept, okay, well, I know they said six months, but they need eight. And then it was 10, then it was 12 and then change orders. And, and it just wasn't working. And I, I knew in my gut that I screwed up, but I kept, you know, doubling down on that mistake. And so what could have only been three months and 30 grand turned out to be 12 months and 150 grand and almost sunk the company because we really, we were exhausted after that. We spent all of our, our little bit of seed money. You know, I didn't take all my, my, my proceeds from my first sale and, plow it in the green pal. Uh, I didn't do that because I wanted green pal to stand on its own. And so it, we almost didn't get started because of that. It almost was, is, was a fatal mistake. So make a mistake, but don't make the same mistake twice. And then try to learn from other people's mistakes. Learn from my mistake. If you're listening to this and you say, you're thinking, yeah, I want to start a startup. I have an idea for some kind of I don't know, tool that Airbnb hosts can use. And, and it's going to be the best tool that turns them into like a super host and turns them into a concierge. I don't know how to code, but it's going to be all digital and interfaces and an app and a website. And, and like, okay, well, that's a technology product. It's not like a traditional business with a little bit of technology. No, that's a technology product. You need to learn how to code. And, you know, well, what about this, uh, what about this like no code platform? And, and then I could just hire somebody to do it. It's kind of like saying, uh, I have an idea for a painting. Now I just need to go find an artist to paint it. Or I have an idea for a song. If only I could find a musician to compose it and sing it, and write it. Like, no, you need to be in that business. So learn from my mistake. Learn from my mistake and hear it and, and apply that so you can, you can avoid it. Um, but yeah, mistakes are going to happen. And that's, you know, that's what makes you a better founder. That's what makes you, that's what gives you the, the knowledge of, of, of what's going to work and what's not, you know, basically that's all this is, is going from one failure to the next without a loss of enthusiasm and just grinding your way through it. So that's just really part of the process. But, but uh, if you, if you keep doubling down on those mistakes, it can really sink the business for it, even get started. That's what almost happened to me. Peachtree, you got to 10 million a year, which is a significant business, eight million, eight, eight figure business. Uh, Green Pals at 30 million, three times the size. What are you learning that is required of you or required uh, to run a 30 million, not of you, but just what's required to run a $30 million business that you're learning now that maybe wasn't required at 10 million? Like what are the differences? Yeah. Now it's a couple of different things. The first business was a blue collar business. It was very much in the trenches, uh, hand to hand combat, uh, very labor driven, uh, people driven. Um, and that was a very hard business to run. Green Pal is a, is a tech business. So it's harder in some ways and easier than in others. So the, the, the way that, that this business is harder, the Green Pal is harder was 
when I was building Green Pal from the start, we were basically inventing a brand new product from scratch that did not exist in the world. So that's a lot harder than just going and running a landscaping business because there's no playbook for how to do it. And people don't know to use it and people don't know how to use it. And, and so like you have to overcome all of these things. But once you can get that dialed in, well, then now you have a technology business that the handful of people are using. And so now you don't have to solve the same problem over and over again. Pretty much every problem you face, there is a technical solution for it. And that's basically what we've spent the decade doing. When you hire a lawn guy, there's about a thousand things that can go wrong between hiring that guy and him showing up and doing a great job. <laughs> Maybe there's 2,000. <laughs> and, sure. and we have slowly solved in, a, in, in like a triage type of fashion the ones that happen the most and it's working our way through the list and we're still solving the problems. Uh, lawn didn't get mowed. Why? Well, uh, the lawn guy, uh, his lawnmower broke down. His lawnmower got stolen. He got a DUI. His helper got a DUI. Lawnmower's too big for the fence gate. Um, his blades were dull. His blade fell off. Like all of these things, like maybe there's 10,000 things, but we have been solving those iteratively little by little, but we don't have to solve the same problems over and over and over again. We just solve new problems. And so that's one of the things that makes it scalable makes it different, and in a way kind of makes it more fun because you're always progressing. Um, no matter how hard I tried in the first business, I still was solving a lot of the same problems every day. Um, that makes sense. It, it, because it was very much a blue-collar, hand-to-hand combat style of business. Obviously, a different skill set for the people that you're hiring, but what about on that question, 10 million versus 30 million? You mentioned before hiring better people, for instance. Are you needing to trade up, if that's the right phrase, talent because of growth? In other words, are people, you mentioned founders, con founders become constrained at some point. Are you finding that with people as well? Like, yeah, this guy was great or gal was great to about 10, 12 million. Beyond that, their skill set doesn't really apply. We have to go to the next level. What about from a people perspective? What does that look like? Yeah. You know, ideally your people grow with you, your co-founders grow with you and they level up. And, and I, I try to hold myself accountable to that as well, that, you know, that I am, am, and suitable to be be doing the things that I'm uh, that I'm doing. I'm, but to be honest, I'm always feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome. And you you kind of should. That's a good that's a good thing. That's a sign that you're in the right zone. That you are you're pushing it hard enough. That you feel a little uneasy. And so I feel that. And so you really want people to grow alongside you. But when when they can't and don't, then you need to find what they are good at and let them just stay on that. And then and then pay up. And get the people that have done what it is you're trying to do at that stage of the game and get them in there. You know, I have a, a search engine optimization uh, strategist that makes about $1,000 an hour. And that's not who we started with. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a consultant freelancer that, that I work with personally on a weekly basis that reviews our strategy, helps me crunch through the data, and, and helps me analyze what's working, what's not. And, and uh, you know, that's not who we started with. But but as time went on, we, we got to a point where we had to bring him in. And uh, so you, it's a combination of both. You want to groom and grow your people alongside you, but you also have to recognize when you need to bring in somebody who's kind of been around the block and is doing what it is that you are trying to do, that you can bring in that knowledge and that experience. So I think it's both. Uh, that makes sense. Let's talk about use of Green Pal. So, like I said, I downloaded it. I used it. Really interesting. What is the current user experience versus the ideal user experience? At least where you see it to be ideal right now. Yeah. Well. Well. Thanks for checking it out. Thanks for trying it out. Um. So. Sure. So you sign up. You get free as a homeowner. You get free quotes, and then you can pick the guy or gal you want to work with. They show up. They do the job. They upload a photo of the job when they're done, and then in your case, remotely. Now you have proof that the, the lawn got mowed and you can see the quality uh, that it got done. And then you can push to pay. And if you liked how it went, you can just set it and forget it. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. As a contractor, you now have an entire operating system to run a small landscaping business. Uh, you have all the customers that you want. You have route optimization. You've got a CRM. You're getting paid every 24 hours. So you don't have accounts receivable anymore. You have a place to, to accumulate all the reviews and ratings about how your business is doing. So you kind of have a business in a, in a box where you can run a, a profitable lawn mowing business and you don't have to do all of like the, the headache of figuring this stuff out, running a Facebook campaign and having a bookkeeper and having a receptionist. GreenPal does all of that for you. Um, 
And it's our job to kind of lower the barriers of entry to, to where people can get in business for themselves. If you're working for a big landscaping company, running a crew, making $25 an hour, why the hell would you do that when you can just download GreenPal and make $75 an hour? That's kind of our vision. So that's really who we've built this for is to help lawn care operators make more money with less hassle, more people get into the business. And then we offer a nice convenience for consumers to order them off the shelf, so to speak. Is there a next level, next level vision, something that you're aspiring to? What we're trying to crack the nut on and figure out is back in the day, like on Airbnb, when you wanted to book an Airbnb, it was very much like a ping pong type of uh, experience where you as the consumer, you would see a list of listings and then you would like ping these hosts and say, hey, can I stay at your place next weekend? And then like maybe it was available, but they would have to come back to you and say, yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead and click here to book. And so it was like two or three steps. That's kind of the experience on GreenPal. As a consumer, you sign up. You have to wait for quotes. Now, in a lot of markets, that's 60 seconds to get five. But some markets, it could be two hours. So you have to, wow. you have to wait for those quotes. And then, and then you hire the guy you want to work with. And then 95% of the time, they show up on the day they're supposed to. But sometimes they don't uh, because of whatever reasons. Um, maybe they got overbooked that day. Maybe they're behind because of rain. Uh, you name it. And so 95% of the, 95% of the time, it, it does work out. 5% of the time, it doesn't. So what we're trying to, to, to improve is using AI, understanding, you know, we've had millions of transactions on the platform at this point. We have enough data to say, okay, your yard in Michigan, it is $37. And this contractor will be there on Thursday, 99% sure of that. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding because of past uh, data that we have around this stuff, uh, being able to predict that and make a better match for you with, with less, with less uh, bad outcomes. How do you solve, you mentioned uh, the 10,000 things that can go wrong. I, I wrote this down because I was curious. How do you solve, uh, what are you solving in terms of, um, you know, the, the blade fell off or the person didn't show, whatever. Like, how do you solve, is that reviews? Is that the big, the big way to ensure that you're matching, you know, reputable landscapers that show up and have, have you know, redundancy processes in place with the, with the client? The key to life, it isn't money, it's happiness. And when you measure how happy you are, you actually become even more happy. Our friends at GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, use a very specific tool to measure their happiness. It's called the Life Happiness Index, and you can have it too. Go over to GoBundance.com slash LHI and take your Life Happiness Index assessment. You'll rate yourself in multiple categories on exactly how happy you are and get a custom output for you specifically that you can use in developing whatever goals you have for your life. GoBundance is the tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people who choose to live epic lives. And the tool GoBundance members use at the base of all of that is the Life Happiness Index. Get out there and grab life big. Reviews is a big part of it. Um, another big part of it is nobody teaches any of us how to run a small business. And so as a, as a lawn mowing operator, nobody ever taught you what it means to be good at customer service, what it means to do preventative maintenance on your equipment, what it means to mow a yard a day early if it's going to rain on Thursday, what it means to follow up, what it means to be proactive and not reactive. And so all of these things that go into being a good small business owner, we bake into the platform to kind of be a coach in their pocket from the first time they get a lawn mowing gig on, on Green Pal to, to we have many vendors doing over a million dollars a year of business on the platform. And so helping them understand what it means to be a good small business owner and what it means to be proactive and not reactive and, and heading off problems solves about 90% of those weird uh, edge cases, but there are some that are quite practical. Um, and so one way that we, we, we deal with this is, uh, we have a, a reliability rating where we know that we, we know that this guy shows up 75% of the time because we're able to measure that. And then we know that this guy only shows up 17% of the time. Well, that guy gets demoted uh, in the platform. He does his bids don't show up as much. We don't send him as many opportunities. And if he hits a certain point, we expel him from the platform. So that's a way that we're able to, to prevent a lot of bad, bad outcomes on the, on the example of your fence gate is too small for his mower. 
uh, we we capture that information when you sign up. So how wide is your fence gate? And if this guy doesn't have a mower uh, small enough for that, we don't give him the opportunity to to bid on your lawn. So there's just hundreds and hundreds of those that we've kind of, sometimes it's an interface change. It's literally a change in the product. Sometimes it's something that's happening underneath the, the behind the scenes that nobody even knows about, but but we're, we're putting into place system changes to where we prevent these things from happening. And I think that's one reason why it's important to go deep in these experiences and not wide. Um, I think the, the idea of like the wide uh, Angie's List, Home Advisor, Craigslist type of experience, I think, I think that's, that's, a, that's a thing of the past. Um, you know, p- consumers are going to be looking for ways to push a button and just get something done. And I think we all kind of, in a way, compete with Uber and Amazon because those two companies have, have conditioned American consumers on magic. And so it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're kind of competing with Amazon because that's what consumers expect. They expect it to show up tomorrow. 99.9999% of the time. And so you have to compete with that, with whatever the hell it is you're doing. That's true. How, uh, how are you going wide in terms of brand awareness? I could see this being an incredible application for a landscaping company. And as a quick aside, when I worked for uh, an insurance company as a director of, of claims, right? Big job and all of that. We had, we had uh, partner shops. So I'm sure if you've ever been in an accident, they say, oh, hey, Here's a shop we can refer you to and we guarantee the business. Those shops would get millions of dollars worth of volume from the insurance company. But I was always blown away at how many fought the insurance company on it. You know, it was like, why are you putting that system in place? Like the system's already there. You don't have to be the accounts receivable guy. You don't have to do any of this stuff. It's there, but you're operating in this archaic mindset. But we didn't need brand awareness of the shop. We just needed brand awareness of the platform. It was progressive insurance, a big insurance company. So flow and national advertising. How does GreenPal, while yes, I get the narrow approach to, to, to the experience, how do you get wide in terms of brand awareness? That's one of the hardest, hardest things that, that a new startup founder uh, has to deal with. How do you get the word out? How do you get brand recognition? You know, we don't have, you know, if you don't have billions of dollars to, to, to deploy in brand campaigns, how do you do that? And I think it's, a lot of it is, 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 is hand-to-hand combat in the early days. It's, it's every single customer experience is a deposit or a withdrawal from the brand equity. Yeah, so you have to look sure. at it. You have to look at it that way. Um, it's building something that people get value from. In the early days, uh, we were just in Nashville, Tennessee, and we spent three years just in Nashville, Tennessee. And I remember it was like year two, we were sitting there talking in our office, and we're like, man, we're still in, we're still just in one city. We need to be, we need to be in like five, 10 cities. And my co-founder said, bro, we had a hundred people use this thing last week and we pissed off 75 of them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't go. need to go to any more cities until yeah. we can make 98 out of a hundred happy. There's no reason to go to another city. And he was right. And so that's brand. I mean, we were making withdrawals from the brand equity. And so we had to make deposits into the brand equity. So it starts with that. You can't, you can't pour marketing dollars on a bad brand or, or on a bad customer experience. So it starts with that. Then once you've got that dialed in, then there's you know, the tactical things of what, what happens when you Google your brand, you know, is it all positive or is it all negative? You know, what do the reviews look like? You know, what are people saying about it? What is the chatter on social media? That's a very tactical thing that oftentimes gets overlooked. I know, I know we've overlooked it at at times. So, so there's that. And then, and then there is, how do you be where it is that people are looking when they need you? And so if you need a lawn mowing service, in Michigan, you know, type lawn mowing service Detroit, we pop up as one, two, or three of the options you can you can consider. Uh, that's brand. You know, you may not have ever heard of Green Pal, but at least it's there when you need it and and you when you're looking for it. Um, and then and then uh, goes on down the line all the way to like, you know, podcast interviews. You know, that's that's one reason why I like doing podcast interviews. I get to talk about Green Pal and why it's important to me and and what how the brand is important to me. You know, maybe somebody might hear that. And, and so it's still very much tactical at this point. We don't have we don't have 10 million dollars to go buy ads on Fox News and CNN like 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 the My Pillow guy and and uh and and Angie's list. But uh but maybe one day we will. Uh but at this point uh, every marketing dollar has to uh has to have like 
ROI on it. So, so brand advertising oftentimes doesn't. That makes sense. That makes sense. I want to get into uh, a passion we both share for travel, but before we do, where can folks learn more about green pal app? Where, where is it found? If you can just kind of direct people that are, yeah. like, I want to check this out. Yeah. And, and you know, just search green pal in the, uh, in the play store or in the uh, iOS store. And then you can, you can just go to greenpal.com. Beautiful. You're a traveler. You're in Dubai. I'm in the Dominican Republic. You've designed, it seems like, your life, uh, as I have, for different reasons. You, I think, are more like, I'm going everywhere. I've, I've looked at your social platform. You're, you're everywhere. I was more like, I want my kids to get an experience in another country. So we moved here uh, for that reason, Spanish and all of that stuff. Top three spots that you've traveled to and why? Well, travel's important to me. I find that like I, I, I want to make as many days a non-blur as possible. So mm-hmm. one of the things starting Green Pal was like five years just went up in smoke. And my, my, my co-founders and I spent like five years in a windowless office and it felt like it just went by in a blink of an eye. And so that bothered me. And so I, I try to make as many days as memorable as possible. And when you're traveling, it kind of does that. Um, some of my favorite places, uh, I, uh, I follow Scott Galloway, Scott Galloway, and he says, yeah. make money in America, spend it in Europe. Uh, and so I just, I just went all through uh, Europe this past December to all the Christmas markets, and that was, that was awesome, all through Germany and all through France and the Netherlands. It's hard to argue with Europe. Um, uh, Barcelona, Spain might be my favorite city in the world, but if it wasn't for that, you know, maybe parts of Brazil I really like. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is is, is awesome. The, uh, I would say it's a toss up between Rio and, and Barcelona. People call that. I've heard that called income hacking. Have you ever heard that term? Income hacking. Yeah. Well, uh, it goes back to uh, f- four hour work week with Tim Ferriss. You know, he was he was the guy that kind of brought that to the mainstream. Uh, he, I think he was living in Argentina at the time. Is and, that from Four Hour Work Week? I didn't know that was from that. Yeah. Income hacking. Yeah, yeah. Where where you make dollars and you make you you earn in dollars and spend in in uh, race or pesos and yeah. yeah it, now I'll tell you it, that arbitrage seems to be going away in a lot of it places is. in the world where you know this you know like there's parts of Brazil where it was more expensive than Miami so it's yeah. not universal and maybe like it's not as like it was 10 or 20 years ago but still i think it exists my uh i've said that people don't believe me because they think Dominican Republic like quote unquote third world or whatever but you can, uh, you, I can live in you can you can spend a million there real easy <laughs> Dude, dude, I live in Punta Cana, which is probably the, I don't know, most expensive part of the island just because of the tourist uh, element. And I've said that it's, it's, I mean, often twice the expense to live here. And it's not, I'm not trying. I'm not like, like, you know, flying helicopters or anything. It's just private school. uh, You know, there's an 18% sales tax on all goods. There's a 10% service charge on a restaurant. So right there, you go out for dinner, 28% on top of it. So, but, but there's other things that the dollar carries. So our, our full-time housekeeper is $500 a month. So laundry, cooking, cleaning, all of that is done. Monday through Friday, 500 bucks a month. And I've heard we're overpaying on that. So, you know, there's some benefits, but income hacking is a, that's people ask like, how are you making a living down there? Like, I don't make a living down here. Like that's right to make a, right. living in, <laughs> make a living up there. And then I'm able to spend it down here. And, uh, that's interesting. What's the next stop after Dubai? Uh, so, um, I don't know a lot about this region. I've spent a little bit of time in Jordan, a little bit of time in Israel, but I've never been to Saudi Arabia. I've never been to Oman. I, I, this is my first time in the UAE. Uh, so I'd like to spend more time here. You know, you see all the stuff that, that they're doing here, and it's just, man, it feels like you're in the future. And so that, that to me, is really cool. It's inspiring. Yeah. And I, and I want to go to the Saudi just to kind of, you know, I, I, I see the stuff in my Instagram feed about, all of these new projects that they're building. So I kind of want to see what's going on over there and, and get a firsthand experience as, as what the culture's like. And, and, and then I can say 20 years, you know, 20 years goes by and they do build the line. I can say, well, you know, I was there when they were just getting started on it. So that's why I'm here. I love it. Somebody wanted to follow your travels. Where can they do that? You mentioned Instagram. Is there yeah, Instagram, Instagram's best place. Uh, Brian M Clayton, just follow me there. It's B-R-Y-A-N, correct? Correct. B-R-Y-A-N. Brian, I appreciate you being on. Thanks for talking all about your, your businesses, your exits, your future exits, whatever. It was a great interview. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jamie. I enjoyed it. 